a nutritarian diet is pr certainly predominantly a diet of natural foods, natural plant foods. And we, there are certain plants that have powerful effects that support human immunity and thicken the microbiome, create a healthy biofilm, allow the body's DNA to effectively heal and silence DNA, DNA defects. And those plants, I um, use that acronym G-BOMBS, which stands for greens, beans, onions, mushrooms, berries, and seeds to represent those six foods that I want people to include in their diet every day. Hey there, this is Ari. Welcome back to the show. In this episode, I'm talking to Dr. Joel Furman, who is a board-certified family physician, seven-time New York Times bestselling author, and nutritional researcher who specializes in preventing and reversing disease through nutritional methods, specifically a nutrition approach centered around a plant-based diet and his specific version of that. He also holds the Eat to Live Retreat in San Diego, California, and through his books, television specials, and virtual speaking engagements, Dr. Furman shares his life-saving nutritional protocols with hundreds of thousands of people around the world seeking to recover from obesity, food addictions, diabetes, heart disease, autoimmune disease, cancer, and other serious health conditions. In this episode, I talked to him about his nutrition approach, how he would compare and contrast it to other nutritional approaches, as well as his critiques of other approaches. And uh, I have a very frank and honest and direct conversation with him. Uh, in some cases, I play devil's advocate to challenge certain positions or ask him what he thinks of other views of, of his positions. And I think you'll get a lot of value from hearing this conversation. So without any further ado, enjoy this conversation with Dr. Joel Furman. Dr. Furman, welcome to the show. Such a pleasure to have you. Great to be here. So you have coined the term nutritarian. Can you tell people what that means and, and why you coined that term? Well, it means to eat a diet that's optimally designed to be in excellent health and promote lifespan, slow aging. But I coined the term because there was no term that adequately described a diet that was based on the right nutritional portfolio of healthy foods. Like you can be on a, on a vegan diet or a plant-based diet, but you can eat unhealthy plant foods that are based from plants. And you could be, and whether you're, you know, a strict vegan or eating some animal products, it doesn't really reflect the quality of what you're eating. Are you eating organic? Are you eating mostly pr eating processed foods? Even whole foods, I mean, uh, certainly a macrobiotic diet where you're just eating mostly brown rice is not optimally designed for human longevity. It's kind of, there's, there's a lot of variants of even of whole food plant-based diets that don't take into the full spectrum of scientific research that, that, that utilize the foods that have the most anti-cancer and anti-aging potential. So I coined that term nutritarian. For us health nuts, that are striving to eat a diet that's as healthy as possible. And, and that's based on science and clinical evidence and performance, you know? Okay, so what, what are the specific foods that comprise the nutritarian approach? Well, you know, the foundational principle, I would like people to write down these five words. The foundational principle is moderate caloric restriction in the context of micronutrient excellence. So those five words are moderate caloric restriction with micronutrient excellence. So now we're now I'm also saying that when you achieve um, comprehensive micronutrient adequacy and you have a good level of nutrients of antioxidants, phytochemicals, and all the substances humans need, it naturally puts you in touch instinctually with the right amount of calories. If you desire the right amount of calories, you're not becoming an over consumer of calories that everybody has to do because they're they're deficient in nutrients and they produce too much uh, metabolic waste in their tissues which drive overeating behavior. So I'm saying that people are out of control the amount of calories they desire because they're not meeting a sufficient level of micronutrients and fiber in their diet. So a, a nutritarian diet is pr certainly predominantly a diet of natural foods, natural plant foods. And we, there are certain plants that have powerful effects that support human immunity and thicken the microbiome, create a healthy biofilm, allow the body's DNA to effectively heal and silence DNA, DNA defects. And those plants, I um, use that acronym G-BOMBS, which stands for greens, beans, onions, mushrooms, berries, and seeds to represent those six foods that I want people to include in their diet every day. 
it's not that they're only eating G-bombs. They can eat other foods too. I mean, papaya and spaghetti squash, and we're not talking, you know, everything, um, quinoa, things you can eat that are not in G-bombs, but we recognize that um, green vegetables are a necessity for normal human immune function. And you have to eat a diet that's essentially rich in green vegetables. And we're talking about raw green vegetables like salads, you know, that includes both lettuce and cruciferous greens like bok choy and kale and collards and arugula, and also cooked vegetables too. So also we're cooking vegetables like broccoli and Brussels sprouts and string beans and asparagus and zucchini. So it's a combination of cooked and raw, both, a, a wide assortment of vegetables, um, it's a vegetable-based diet. It's not a grain-based, plant-based diet. It's not a potato-based, not a fruit-based. It's it's vegetable-based. And I want people to eat a variety of foods. I want them to eat fruits and nuts and beans and 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 whole grains, but I don't want them to be predominant on um, you know, on nuts and fruit or grains as the major source of calories. The major source of calories should be vegetables, and the other things should be a little lesser amounts. Mm -hmm. um, and I recognize that a nutritarian diet is unique because Americans and people in the Western world get most of their fat in their diet from animal fats and oils. Plant oils and animal fats is where they get their fat in their diet. A nutritarian diet is completely different. We get our fat from whole nuts and seeds and avocado, not from the oil extracted from the nuts and seeds. So we don't use sesame seed oil. We use the whole sesame seed. We don't use the avocado oil. We use the whole avocado. So, And there's a huge amount of scientific literature. I'm talking about more than probably 50 different studies showing the longevity potential when people switch their fat sources from animal fats and oils into whole foods sources of fat. And there's also a new, um, an extremely um, corroborative amount of scientific evidence that when people try to eliminate all fat from their diet and cut back on all fat and just eat and don't eat any fat in their diet, they also don't do as well, don't live as long have higher rates of heart attack and cancer. So we do, it is um, beneficial to include some fat in your diet regularly, but the best source of fat, walnuts, flax seeds, chia seeds, pistachio nuts, almonds, sesame seeds, things that are real food that we can blend into make dressing sauces. We can make Thai curry sauce and, you know, almond cashew dressing. We can make it all types of um, Russian dressings and Caesar dressings and sauces and flavorings and desserts using nuts and seeds and blending them in there instead of using oil as the fat, as the fat source. Got it. And where do animal foods fit into this nutrition plan, if at all? Well, people have the option of doing a strictly vegan version to just a plant-based diet or to use animal products as a condiment in small amounts. But it certainly recommends people move towards and try to eliminate as much animal product consumption as they possibly can. Um, you know, the question is how much is going to be more dangerous and how much is safe. And I'm saying that um, most of the evidence, and we can go through some studies showing from 2018, 2019, 20, you know, all the last four years, um, repeated studies show that as animal protein goes up in the diet, you have more cancer deaths and more overall mortality. And as plant protein goes up in the diet, you have longer lifespan and the parameters and how that works, we could talk about. But so we're trying to reduce animal protein and increase plant protein foods. And all whole plants are, are rel have you could say protein adequacy, except for fruit. You know, if you're putting oil on your food or, or white flour, you're, you're diluting the protein content of your diet because oil doesn't have any protein. But if you ate the whole nut that had the oil in it, then you're getting protein from the nut. So if you're eating, you know, if you took the whole wheat berry and not just the white flour portion, the point is, is if you, when you use whole foods, you get sufficient protein, almost any combination, if, unless your diet is too high in fruit, because fruit's particularly low in, whole, in, in protein. And our ability to assimilate protein and to utilize it for good health and, and good immune function um, deteriorates as we age, especially past the age of 80. So 75, 80, people's ability to absorb protein might diminish. And that's what we're saying that um, the biological value of protein is sufficient from plants when you're eating a whole food and when you're eating whole foods like beans and nuts and green vegetables. So beans, nuts, and green vegetables have the highest protein as a whole food and a nutritarian diet and they're also low glycemic foods. They don't raise blood sugar. So we're eating our diet with sufficient beans as our number one preferred carbohydrate source because they're higher in protein and they have more slowly digestible, lower glycemic carbohydrates. And then the question is then, well, how much animal products is okay or you know, not gonna be not damaging? And the answer is probably somewhere in that five to 10% range for most people. 
Most of us follow the nutritarian diet, rarely, if ever, of animal products. We don't need them. But it's probably not damaging if you had them in very small amounts. But as you people use them above 10%, you definitely see um, then genetic weaknesses start to express themselves. You see heart disease start to occur in populations, cancers start to occur in populations. What I'm saying right now is that via various mechanisms, we're, we're protecting our longevity and have this unprecedented opportunity in human history to really push that envelope of human longevity without any risk of cancer and heart disease by eating natural plants and keeping animal products to a minimum in our diet if we're eating them. What do you think of the arguments that have been made by some around mortality trade-offs, disease trade-offs? And um, it's forgive me because it's been a few years since I looked at the literature on this topic. But if I remember correctly, there are only very few studies that have looked at the quality of the diet that have considered that as a confounding variable in the studies that compare more plant-based diets or vegan diets or vegetarian diets to meat containing diets, omnivorous diets. Um, I think it was the UK's UK shoppers study, if I remember correctly, where, which was one of the studies where they, they specifically examined more ethical omnivores, people who were making choices to eat, you know, things like grass fed beef or, or pasture raised dairy and free range chicken and so on. Um, and I've seen people make the argument that when you look at those kinds of evidence, what you see is, is really very little difference in overall all-cause mortality and lifespan between vegans and vegetarians versus omnivores. And what, what you do see is more of a, a difference in specific diseases. So vegan diets tend to, be, to have very strong evidence uh, that they lower heart disease risk and cancer risk. But the risk of sarcopenia and diseases associated with that generally go up. And, you know, ba basically the argument is that, you know, vegan diets lower your risk of these specific diseases, but they might increase risk of other things like muscle wasting and sarcopenia over here. And therefore, you know, don't really have a, a net benefit. What do you think of those kinds of arguments? I think that they're um, inadequate and they're not looking at the full um, amount of evidence we have. They're just trying to use an argument and trying to collect some data to support those arguments based on some British studies where there was a study on British vegans that you're talking about where they had more osteoporosis. But when you analyze the diets that were being used, they're eating tremendous amounts of white flour products and processed foods. Their diet was, was overly um, burdened with carbohydrates, did not have nuts and seeds and beans in it. And I analyzed the diet you, that were most people following in that study. They had half the calcium compared to the, I compared it on a blog compared to a nutritarian diet compared to the Dutch diet being followed in the UK study you're referring to. And they had half the calcium and half the protein compared to the diet, a nutritarian diet, which uses, a, you know, the regular use of beans and nuts and greens and the vegetables in the diet each day. So it was, they were, and the, so the diet was, um, I was critical of that diet, that type of vegan diet by my standards of nutritional excellence and think that they're not examples of healthy eating and the data comparing um, you know, grass-fed or healthy versions of animal, healthier versions of animal products has fall, flopped on its face because all these recent studies, and I can show, I can pull up on my screen, I can pull some studies up to show people if you'd like. Um, sure. what, okay, let's do that now. Let's see if I can get them. That um, that look at this and most of the, um, the negative effects of animal products and the shortening of lifespan that occurred, occurred in studies where they used in you know, in Australia or South America or around the world where they do use grass fed and, and more naturally, not commercial raised animal products. There was no difference between longevity reduction from animal products used from commercial sources in the United States or used that are, that were more wild or grass fed from other countries. The same corroborating data when everybody, anybody did the study. And the studies on um, looking at reduction of red meat and longevity don't show a reduction of longevity from red meat because they're because what foods are the people eating when they reduce the red meat? And invariably they're eating more chicken and pasta and olive oil. They're not, they're eating, so they reduce red meat and they don't eat more natural plants in place of red meat like beans or nuts or greens. So that's why these studies have so much more value because most of the studies where people say, look, not much difference in meat reduction is because the people ate more white meat. They just ate more chicken. They just reduced red meat for chicken. And then people, so they're saying, look, meat's not so bad, but they just ate more chicken. Well, the problem is, is chicken doesn't contain phytochemicals and antioxidants. It's also, it's not, it's a nutrient 
it's just a, a source of macronutrients of protein and fat, but it has no significant micronutrient load, fiber, phytochemicals, sterols, stanols, all the things that extend human lifespan are in the beans and the nuts and the greens. And it's not about just cutting in chicken and eating more pasta and olive oil. It's cutting back on meat and eating more beans and nuts and green vegetables. And on those studies, we do have available today. And we see market benefits in longevity. We're talking about 40% reduction in cancer, 40% reduction in heart attack rates, 30% reduction in cancer rates, and, and no um, cause of sarcopenia or muscle wasting. The only thing that these paleo and carnivore people also do to, to confuse people is they talk about studies on strokes because there's a, ratio, there's a relationship between higher cholesterol levels and hemorrhagic stroke in Asian countries because they eat so much salt in those Asian countries. They'll eat like between 3,000 and 5,000 milligrams of sodium a day and they'll be on diets that are mostly plant-based. And the sodium causes microvascular hemorrhaging and weakening of the endothelial lining over time. And it weakens the blood vessels in the brain. And those, those Asian populations have a much higher risk of hemorrhagic stroke than embolic or ischemic stroke in this country. So when we're looking at reduction in stroke, you're looking at the reduction of hemorrhagic or ischemic stroke, not the reduction of embolic stroke. In other words, I'm saying now is they have 10 times the amount of hemorrhagic stroke in those Asian countries that consume a lot of salt. We have 10 times the amount in the United States of ischemic or embolic stroke caused by clots, caused by eating high cholesterol foods and saturated fat. They have so the, the different type of fat strokes. One's caused by a clot, the other's caused by a bleed, which is the opposite of a clot, completely opposite. And eating a diet with more bacon and cheese and cholesterol in it or whatever you're eating to produce more atherosclerosis thickens the blood vessels in the brain and makes them more resilient or resistant to cracking open and bleeding into them when you're having a high salt diet. But it's still the salt that caused the stroke on a, on a diet that was more plant-based. And if you didn't have the salt, you wouldn't have had a hemorrhagic stroke. So what I'm saying is that there's a that cholesterol levels affect risk of ischemic stroke because if the cholesterol is higher, you have higher risk of ischemic stroke and cholesterol levels affect the risk of hemorrhagic stroke because as the, vex as the cholesterol goes lower, you have higher risk of hemorrhagic stroke. So less, so the cholesterol levels, so they can look at low cholesterol countries that aren't eating a lot of animal products and see, look, when you give them more animal products and more meat, they have lower rates of hemorrhagic stroke. When you raise their cholesterol, they have lower rates of stroke in Asian countries. Okay, that's true, but our goal isn't to switch. Is that's still not our goal is to have neither type of stroke, and and that's so. I think a nutritarian diet is just a step above, um, and, it's, and it's a lot of confusion. And as you know, the confusion is because people have agendas they want to push, and they're not looking at the nutritional research in an unbiased manner and trying to ascertain what's best. They always have some preference they want to, you know. But let me. I want to. I want to ask you about that. Um... You're, you're kind of almost answering the question I'd like to ask you already, but I suspect you have a lot more to say on it. Um, I listened to, for example, uh, a conversation that you had with uh, Paul Saladino, uh, who is an advocate of carnivore diets. And to be honest, it was, it was kind of painful to listen to uh, because you were kind of, you guys were just really speaking- it was Languages. It was painful to do it. He just refuses to accept the 20,000 studies that indicate he's wrong. He mm -hmm. just, it's like saying, you know, I only accept this type of study. I'm not going to accept any, or all those other studies that show I'm wrong. I just refuse to accept those. He's just, it's just an unreasonable. And you know, there's always radical extremists in politics and nutrition and, you know, everything, as you know, and mm -hmm. we, it's just extreme viewpoint that, and we have, you know, the American College of Lifestyle Medicine with more than 10,000 physicians and nutritional, you know, advocates with pretty much trying to think and putting into people's and to advising people to better their health through lifestyle changes, sleep and exercise and, and emotional poise and eating healthfully. And, you know, there's nobody that would, you know, to, that would recommend a diet based on meat. That's just too, it's, irres it's completely irresponsible and radical and wrong, you know. So I shouldn't have even agreed to be interviewed by him. So we're in a, an interesting time period in history where we now have every conceivable type of food that has has been demonized somewhere by someone. And this this the spectrum now spans from, you know, the the extremes of hardcore veganism to the extremes of people saying you should eat 
really only meat or only animal foods. And that, I mean, people are literally making the argument, some of these carnivore uh, diet advocates, they're saying plants are trying to kill you because they're full of uh, phytochemicals or which, which are essentially a form of plant toxin. And so they argue based on this sort of logic that if the plant evolved these chemicals in order to dissuade uh, predators, whether herbivores or insects from eating it, or to make them feel unpleasant side effects if they consume too much of that plant. Therefore, that chemical is toxic. And you don't want to eat a toxic compound, do you? Because toxins are bad for you. And therefore, plants are bad for you because they're full of these toxins. And uh, I've seen that a number of these sorts of um, of carnivore diet advocates who have put forth that line of argumentation have been quite successful in um, in convincing many, I assume probably hundreds of thousands of people at this point that that that's true that these plants are full of toxins which are harming them. Uh, I'm curious if you have any thoughts on that specific claim. Well, it's so utterly ridiculous to even have to you know we know that fight the, the American diet and modern the standard American diet leads to 40% of Americans dying of heart attacks and strokes, the leading cause of death in adults. We know that as people eat more vegetables, they have low, that lowers the risk of heart attacks and strokes, and as they eat more animal products, it increases the risk. I mean, this is stuff is well established, and, and I have 20,000 studies to demonstrate that. So these are, there's radical people in every field, as we talked about, and you can always find some followers of people who believe that, that attack the Capitol, that believe um, Trump won the election, and they were saving, you know, there are people that think that climate change doesn't exist. There are people that think that there's all types of, um, and there's millions, there's much more millions of people that are like, that are, let's say Trump supporters. And there are people who think that you could better eat all meat into your diet. You know what I mean? So we have, we all have all kinds of radical people with unreasonable way of thinking. Let me, could you enable me to share my screen? Sure. And, Cause I, and then I could show you some studies to review some studies quickly. Um, okay, you should be good to go now. Okay, yeah, that worked. Let's just take a look. Can you see that now? Yes. You can see that. Okay, so here's four studies, 2016, 2018, 2019, 2020, that just didn't look at people reducing meat. They looked at people, and these are studies that put together meta-analysis, different researchers around the world put together um, looking at people's, not just reduction of meat, but actually what about when they eat more plants? What about when they ate more plant protein or high protein plant foods like beans and nuts and, and, and whole grains and didn't just cut back on meat and ate more chicken, but actually ate more plants. So eat, look at the title of these studies, Association of Animal and Plant Protein Intake with All Cause and Cause Specific Mortality. We're talking about 30% reductions of all cause mortality. There's tremendous reduction of mortality when people increase more plants. Here's the other one, patterns of plant and animal protein take strongly associated with the cardiovascular mortality. So, uh, um, you know, another year, different researchers also publishing associated with animal and plant protein intake. Um, we're talking about all these studies show the same thing, dramatic enhancements in lifespan when people eat more vegetables and beans and nuts in their diet. And, that, and we're talking about um, instead of eating animal products or just and it, 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 even if you cut out processed foods and eat more plant protein, in other words, the, if, even if you cut out pasta and white bread and oil and eat more nuts and beans and grain and whole grains and, you know, and green vegetables, you get longer lifespan. Anything, anytime you take any food out of the diet, because the average American diet is 60% processed foods, which is just empty calories, and then 33% animal products, which don't contain phytochemicals or antioxidants. So these people saying, well, it's not good to consume phytochemicals or antioxidants in, in colorful plants. Well, the opposite is true. Phytochemical, our immune system and all nutritional and all you know, legitimate scientists recognize that the, the intraepithelial lymphocytes that line the, the villi in the digestive tract and are, are the defenders of the gates of the castle build up with exposure to flavonoids and phytochemicals, particularly the Aryl hydrocarbon receptor is dependent on green vegetables derived substances to have normal immune system. You know, so we can't even have a normal immune system to defend us against viruses and infections if we don't eat a lot of green, if we don't eat green vegetables. And all the studies demonstrate this. There's no, there's no studies that demonstrate better immune function or longer life with, with a carnivore diet. Show me one study that showed when people ate more meat 
and less vegetables, they live longer, or less beans, they live longer. No things, nothing exists in the world. And we have thousands of studies that show otherwise. And in my most recent book, Eat for Life, I have 2,000 medical references in there documenting that. And I've reviewed maybe 20, 30,000 to get those 2,000. But let's, we can go through a few more slides here. Let's look at, here's a- Let me ask you this uh, before you go on. Um, two, two questions. Number one would be, there are anecdotes of, and, and this, is, this is really the reverse of the same question I asked Paul Saladino when I spoke to him. Uh, which I would say was probably the most frustrating podcast I've I've ever done um, because it's just it's very difficult to to speak the, the same language and uh, agree on the the terms of how we're going to play the game. Right. But uh, what I asked him was if if plants are so toxic and and full of these chemicals that are so damaging, how do you explain how not only so many studies can exist showing. Uh, just as long or longer lifespan or protection against various diseases or so many, uh, you know, obviously tens or hundreds of thousands of, of anecdotes of people who have adopted vegan diets who have gotten healthier. But what I'm seeing now is uh, uh, a trend where a lot of people, I think, have been swayed by, you know, um, some of the the pro-meat arguments. And that includes not only the carnivore camp, which I consider the extreme of it, but, um, you know, some of the more paleo type uh, diet uh, proponents who uh, are generally in favor of higher intake of, of animal protein. But so let me ask you the reverse of this. And admittedly, we don't have nearly anywhere close to any sort of comparable amount of evidence to show benefits from carnivore diets. But what we do have are several thousand testimonials that now exist of people saying that their health has been improved by a carnivore diet. So how how would you uh, sort of rebut that? How would you explain how that's possible? It's almost irrelevant because we're talking about soft endpoints versus hard endpoints. Let me explain that for a minute. I can take overweight people and put them on cigarettes, have them all start smoking cigarettes. And these overweight people will lose weight and their triglycerides will improve because the smoking will curtail their appetite. And they may even feel better or have better diabetic control because they're losing weight from smoking cigarettes. That's a soft endpoint. The soft endpoint means your triglycerides went down, you lost weight, you're not craving food as much, you know, craving overeating as much. There's some benefits to smoking cigarettes. But to know for sure if that's a safe way to lose weight, we have to follow groups of people for decades who smoke and then see what the hard endpoints show. Are they really living longer or is this a dangerous way to facilitate a, a soft endpoint? And with statin drugs, the same thing. We give people a statin drug to lower their cholesterol. Okay, their cholesterol is better, but that's a soft endpoint. How do we know that just lowering the cholesterol, the statin drug is actually gonna make a person live longer? Maybe it's gonna increase risk of more cancers than the number of heart attacks it prevents. And until we follow those people for decades, and we have to follow large numbers to see effects. We can't follow 100 people. We have to follow hundreds of thousands of people for, for probably more than 10 years, preferably 20 years, like two decades. So we have enough people dying and get the ages they died at. We have to have enough people that died using this program, enough people that died using that program to look at a hard endpoint. So a study has higher credence value. If let's list those three criteria for high credence. Number one, looking at hard endpoints like heart attack, cancer, age of death, cause of death. And, and then number two, we followed them for decades, not from six months to see benefits. And because it could be short-term benefits and soft endpoints. And number three, there was a large enough number of people to see a significant effect on the data. You have to have you know 5,000 deaths in there to see how long people live. This is gonna be a really accurate study. And then once we have a high credence study with 5,000 deaths, are there other researchers different parts of the world with another study that went for 25 years with hundreds of thousands of people showing the same corroborating evidence? Or is this a one out of a, or is this a, um, a, you know, a, a, something out of, you know, a, something of, a, you know, a needle in a haystack study where the other studies don't all agree with it. And all those things sh show consistency. It's not that one study contradicts another. 
all the well, the largest, most high credence studies all corroborate each other and show the same thing. And they also show a dose dependent relationship between animal product intake in the long term studies. One study I'm referring to, I could bring that one up too, goes on for 25 years, more than 100,000 people, and tr giving people a zero to 20 score based on how much animal protein they're consuming. 20 would be like a carnivore diet, zero would be a vegan diet. And it showed as every as the animal product intake score went from one to two to three to four to five to fifteen to sixteen as it went up heart attack deaths went up in a dose dependent manner. So was the study is, is the data all over the place or is it dose dependent? Is it consistent with the, as you eat more you see more disease, or is there some other confounding variables? So we're saying that the studies are done very well. They corroborate each other. They good hard endpoints. And true, some people get short-term benefits from going on a, from cutting out all carbohydrates, getting better um, glucose control. Some people are, you know, gluten sensitive or have allergies and things to to certain components of beans that they do better when they go, you know, they can, they might get some benefits from going cutting out beans and grains from their diet, for example. So there are some people who could benefit from that. But you could do though, you can adjust the diet for people who have food sensitivities on a plant-based diet too, but the, but the problem is any of those benefits on a diet rich in animal products are going to result in shorter lifespan. And it's just, it's sad for the people adopting it and for the people promoting it, you know, cause they're believing in something that's, that's not going to be in their own best interest to eat that way. Um, and the probabilities are highly against them when we have so much um, corroborating evidence from thousands of studies showing otherwise. So okay. I think it's, um, you know, if you feel better eating a little bit of animal products, my suggestion would be you still should keep it a little better. You should still keep that to a very small amount and eat mostly natural, natural whole plants to get the full levels of phytochemicals and antioxidants you are, you need because you can't have normal immune function and protection against cancer or protection against the inflammatory effects of animal protein, which makes the body produce more, which makes the gut bacteria produce more pro-inflammatory compounds like TMAO, trimethylamine oxide. You raise IGF-1 to cancer-promoting levels. You create certain um, other um, oxidative damage to the body, which produces more reactive oxygen species in the body and advanced glycation end products, lipofusion and other ammonia and urea and other factors that age us. So it's just, um, non it's just almost to the point of being silly and we have, it's, it's, a re, it's ridiculous viewpoints that are not supported by science, but you still have people doing all, having all types of belief systems. I think the central argument that sort of facilitates this shift in, in how they can argue in favor of this is basically to, to say that ep, the whole uh, field of epidemiology, that type of research is, yeah. is nonsense and yeah. that doesn't mean anything. And that therefore the only things that mean anything are randomized controlled studies. And that's the only true science. That's the only way we can actually know something is, is real versus all this epidemiological stuff is just garbage. It's trash, trash pile type research. And therefore we can take these tens of thousands of studies that have been accumulated over, you know, 50 years of nutritional research looking at so, kind of yeah. hard endpoints that you're talking about actual mortality outcomes and disease outcomes and death at certain ages. And we just immediately throw it all in the garbage. Throw it all in the garbage, garbage. right. And, and, just, then, and then we get to select what specific randomized controlled studies we're, we're going to pull from and then extrapolate based on that, what, what diet is best for health. What, what do you think of that argument? It's, uh, it's utterly hysterical, you know, so it's just totally ridiculous. First of all, randomized control studies are short-term studies looking at soft endpoints. They don't show anybody living longer, or reducing rate of cancer, having any benefits. They're just looking if your lower cholesterol went down, your triglycerides went down, or a person lost weight. You can't, those studies generate a hypothesis. They don't generate conclusion. You have to have agreement with, with long-term um, high credence studies with randomized control trials. You can't, so they, they're saying they're going to disregard all randomized controlled, all um, large scale epidemiologic um, studies representing hundreds of thousands of people who are devoted scientific researchers. That's their career and a lifestyle who control for variables and are, and are excellent at what they've done. So they're just, so you can believe anything. You could say, well, I don't care about all the courts of law that that said that there was no evidence that Trump didn't win. And I don't care about this and I don't care about that. I only care about this. I only care about this one guy who told me the dominion. It's like, it's just ridiculous thinking like to, to pick their own criteria. They're going to pick just one type of study 
that they want to um, show benefit. And plus the fact that even among those studies, you don't see as a benefit of cholesterol lowering and you don't see better short-term weight loss, diabetic reversal, because both diets that are healthy vegan diets also show in short-term randomized studies, those benefits as well. And here's, I, I put on the screen, two of my studies that I was involved with, right? One is called Nuts and Seeds for Heart Disease Prevention and Reversal, published in 2020, where there were 15 refer 50 references. The next study is Improved Cardiovascular Parameters, more than, more than I think there were more than 450 people there whose average blood pressure dropped 26 points within six months as their medications were taken away and they lost weight with people who reversed advanced heart disease. In other words, with people with heart failure and heart attacks and blockages that were reversed, got their health back by, a, by this nutrient-dense plant-rich eating style that I call a nutritarian diet. So here's just a um, resolution of high blood pressure, reversal of, and that's a, and that's certainly illustrative cases in, in six months of benefits. But then the question is, is that way of eating safe? Are there any long-term studies that show it's safe to eat a diet like this? And what would happen if people ate that diet for 30 years or 50 years? And we have so much evidence on this, which I'm demonstrating already. So you can't just, you know, you have to put all the evidence together. And when you put all the evidence together, it points clearly with the preponderance of evidence towards the fact that um, that we know the, the healthiest way to advise people. And the seven-day Adventist Health Study 2, which I have on the screen here, is such an important study. And the reason it's such an important study is because the seven-day Adventists don't, they don't smoke and they don't gen drink generally. They generally are a healthier, um, they're religious, um, you could say, advisors, advise them to take good care of their health. And many of them are plant-based eaters or vegans, near vegans, flexitarians, pescatarians. They're, they're, and, and then those of them that eat animal products are eating less processed animal products and lower amounts of animal products. So in this study of healthy, in these studies, we're looking at people who generally are eating and living much healthier, exercising, thinner, living healthier, some including more animal products and some not. There's difference in, in, in the individual cohorts and there's not as many confounding variables. So we can look at a vegan and seeing, well, does the vegan do better when they don't eat nuts or when they do eat nuts? And what this study showed, these studies showed that groups with the highest meat intake had a 60%, you know, you could say higher cardiovascular death. Those with low with the highest nut intake had the lower 40% of had lower than 40% cardiovascular death. We're talking about we modulate cardiovascular death, the major cause of death, by by modulating meat and nuts. And more nuts are less more meat. We have more meat, more death, more nuts, less death. And and tremendously differences in death, not a little bit of difference in death. We're talking about 40 to 60% difference of, of, of premature deaths. And so the and actually, what's interesting here is that the vegans who weren't eating any animal products, who ate no nuts and seeds, did not live as long as the people who ate a little bit of animal products who ate nuts and seeds regularly. Those, so the vegans who ate nuts and seeds lived the longest, but the, vegans, but the vegans who ate no nuts and seeds didn't live as long as the people who ate some animal products, small amounts, but also ate nuts and seeds, demonstrating how valuable it is to use nuts and seeds as your source of fat um, in, the di in the diet. But obviously, clear um, studies that I don't know how people could um, look to, you know, bash or disregard or to say, well, okay, you could say, well, okay, that's one study, but do you have other studies from different parts of the world who show similar benefits or similar effects? And the answer is, yeah, we have we have twenty studies that document the same thing occur in those populations too, and not one. How could there's so many mistaken studies that are all wrong? How come they can't find one that shows there's a long-term lifespan benefit looking at to a to a meat-based or heavy meat diet? What about the, you know that? So the whole whole argument is ridiculous. How would you? Um... Here's meat intake and mortality: a prospective study of over half a million people. You know, following talking about 47,000 male deaths and twenty-three thousand female deaths. Of course, all these studies are wrong, right? They're saying, right? Red meat and processed meat increased risk of total mortality and cancer mortality, right? So we're talking here about 
just disregard every study done by all the top researchers in the world and just pick, just believe this one guy who's telling you to eat a carnivore diet and telling you not to believe any study except my one study that's, a, you know, whatever. It's just ridiculous. Okay, got it. Are there, are there, we shouldn't, any- having, we shouldn't even be having to talk about this. We should be motivating people to let them know that they have this incredible opportunity not to have a heart attack if they eat a healthy diet and not to be confused by nonsense, you know. Are there any other studies you want to show before I shut down screen share for now? No, nah, I can. Now nah, that's enough. Okay. Um, so let me ask you this, and I I suspect this is a question you've you've never been asked before. I'm curious if you've thought about it. Sure. There's not a whole lot of research that exists to be able to answer it, but I'm curious what your thoughts are. So, um, the field of research, and, and this is actually what I told uh, Paul Saladino when I spoke to him in person when I met him for the first time when he he argued to me that um, these compounds in, in plants were toxins that are harmful to health. I said, you know that there's a whole field of research that has existed for decades on this topic where scientists all over the world have been studying the effects of these chemicals in plants on human physiology, and it's it's called xenohormesis. And we we have thousands of studies on xenohormesis on many hundreds of different phytochemicals and their health effects. And um, while you can certainly cherry pick examples of actual plant toxins that are genuinely harmful to health, um, the overall body of literature on things like curcumin and quercetin and anthocyanins and um, sulforaphane and many, many dozens of others. Flavonoids, you know, right? Yeah. It is very clear that they have a positive effect, not only in nutritional epidemiological research, but in randomized controlled studies, in in many thousands of randomized controlled studies that show clear beneficial effects and reductions of mechanisms of neurological disease or cancer or things like that. So um, I'm curious though, as a form of hormetic stress, as something that um, acts through hormetic pathways, which is, this is a big area of passion of mine. It's the subject of my next book. One of the principles that's important in that area is, well, I'd say two. One, there's generally always a biphasic dose response in terms of hormetic stressors, which which means for listeners, that means that um, a little or moderate amounts are very good and associated with benefits. But if you have way too much, it can create harm. This is even true with things like exercise. For example, if you are doing massive amounts of exercise, running uh, yeah. or ultra vitamins every week or something like that, you're, you're or vitamin D or the, or iron, anything you take too much of it, this is sure. exactly what you said, a biphasic, too little is bad and too much is bad. Right. Even sun exposure, we get too much of it. It's It right. can be harmful, create DNA damage. If we drink two gallons of water in the next 10 minutes, we can cause permanent brain damage, put ourselves in a coma. Everything's in toxic in too large amounts. Right. Um, and if even if even that's true of water, uh, I'm curious if you have any thoughts on if there's a threshold at which too much phytochemicals might start to turn into a net negative instead of a net beneficial effect. No, it's, it's, we're, we're a primate. We're only a fraction of a chromosome different from gorillas and chimps. We're designed to be plant-based eaters our digestive tract and such. And the evidence on what your biphasic response has shown that when you're getting, let's say, beta carotene from food, you're getting it in a spectrum of 100 other carotenoids too in the right amount. You can't get levels that are toxic unless you took beta carotene in a pill without the other carotenoids because it competes with absorption with the other 100 carotenoids. And you can't overabsorb one when you're taking in food that has 100 different types. It's the same thing with phytochemicals. The only way, there's only about 100 different glucosinolates and isothiocyanates from cruciferous vegetables that you can't get a concentration of one to cause damage like that unless you concentrate it in a pill without the other isothiocyanates and glucosinoids that were in the food. Food prevents us from that happening. And we're de- our bodies are designed to accept these phytochemicals from food. But when we think we're going to isolate them because sulforaphane from broccoli is so powerfully against cancer, we're going to f- concentrate that sulforaphane in a pill and take it in a higher dose that you couldn't achieve from a food. That's when we see these problems develop. That, you know, that's when we see the potential for what you're talking about, which now the body's being irritated by this chemical to a degree without having compensatory ability to build back stronger in response to it because the chronic exposure is too high and too often. 
Mm. So yes, it's it's not possible to do that with real food, only when you concentrate them in supplemental form. Uh, and this is this is sort of an argument in the direction of too much use of herbal extracts or or plant food extracts could potentially uh, create some negative effect in in that way and and an argument in favor of deriving most of these phytochemicals from whole foods correct okay. so that's right we derive most of our chemicals from whole foods we could say what about just extracting those anti-cancer nutrients and adding them to the diet in a pill not going to be as effective or as safe as taking them in a food form which we've designed which our bodies and the our our you know prehistoric ancestors' bodies have been eating these chemicals for thousands and hundreds of thousands of years, mushrooms and onion, the organosulfite compounds in mushrooms, I mean, in, in onions and the different compounds in green vegetables. We've developed a dependency on these, such as ergotheanine found in mushrooms and other um, foods that we have a receptor on the cell walls that bring the ergo, that attach, ergotheanine attaches and stabilizes DNA from aging. And why would we even have an ergotheanine receptor that stabilizes the, the aging of the cell if we weren't have some ergotheanine exposure in our environment eating mushrooms? It's, you know, it's the body, the human body or the primate body wouldn't even have that in there. Um, the point is we have all these receptors and we have the um, antioxidant response element that's fueled by flavonoids and other, and, and isothiocyanides. In other words, it turns on the, the, um, antioxidant response element. It's called the NR NRF2 transcription protein activates, is activated by these phytochemicals we're talking about that turns on the antioxidant response element that enables the cell to repair broken DNA cross links, remove toxins, and otherwise heal and reconstitute healthy tissue in cells that are damaged. And why would it, there was that, that mechanism be fueled by phytochemicals if we didn't have them exposure to them in our diet? The whole idea is just utterly um, anti-science. Mm -hmm. Do you think it's within the realm of possibility that, let's say, if you compared all things being equal within the nutritarian approach, let's say mm -hmm. you compared a purely vegan diet versus one that contained, let's say, five or ten percent of calories from whatever the the animal foods are that you would say are the most benign. So let's let's take red meat and processed meats certainly out of this. And let's say maybe seafoods and uh, I don't know what you feel about dairy or, or eggs, but what, so, something like that, five or 10% from animal foods where you're getting some of these proteins, which some people argue are more bioavailable, give you a little bit higher protein intake than, than plant proteins do. W would you be surprised if that diet performed better in all cause mortality than the purely vegan, vegan diet? No, I wouldn't be surprised because um, we're talking about a vegan diet is lacking in certain nutrients that have to be supplemented appropriately to maximize human health and longevity. Zinc, B12, EPA and DHA, iodine, vitamin D, and maybe K2. So there are certain nutrients you more readily absorb from animal products, particularly zinc and DHA and EPA, which people call fish oil, but you have them in salamanders and snakes and frogs and other foods besides fish. But the problem is, is that with, with modern agriculture, we have so much nitrogen runoff that we've caused so much algae bloom with the cyanobacteria that feed off the algae. And now the, the bivalves, clams, oysters, scallops, and mussels have so much BMAA and microplastic compounds and other shellfish and, and um, like lobster and crab that have so much BMAA and, and BMAA and other and, and plastics. And, and so the point is, is that um, if we probably supplementing a vegan diet with a small amount of omega-3 and BH12 and zinc containing seafood would enhance longevity in a primitive population. But in a modern population, we've polluted the shores and the coastlines to you where the average American now has a credit card amount of plastic in their body. And we have, we have um, clusters of uh, Parkinson dementia syndrome and ALS it, it, near um, lakes and coastal waterways where people are eating more seafood because of the pollution and the runoff of the, of, of agricultural chemicals. So, so now I'm, now we're thinking, meaning me and my cohorts who think like me, other, you know, that it's better to use a supplemental omega-3 fatty acid 
because we know that brain shrinkage on a vegan diet, if you're not going to, if you have no exposure to seafood or EPA or DHA, we could have increased risk of dementia or cognitive impairment or even Parkinson's disease from low omega-3 index. So we're talking about supplementing a vegan diet with those nutrients that you would be beneficially getting more of if you ate some animal products, which are mostly B12, zinc, and DHA and EPA, because the zinc phytates from plant foods do bind zinc absorption. So I'd rather take my chances with using a vegan diet. And we've seen, and, and obviously my being, I mean, been in practice more than three decades and all my patients who came to me in their 50s and 60s and 70s with heart disease and early cancers and all types of problems and psoriasis and uh, got well and are living between 97 and 100, they're living long lives. They're, they're remarkably living long lives. And so, so we're seeing tremendously ability to live a long life. When you, and so I advise people in my, and I practice myself, I take a supplement of EPA and DHA and I actually sell the supplement because I have it, this is a monopoly on who makes the, the companies that manufacture it, make it for all the vitamin companies. So all the vitamin companies that sell algae-based DHA and EPA, which is a vegan form of fish oil, it's all made by the same company that they just bottle it and market it differently, right? But we make, we, what we do differently is we, I started packing it in glass and keeping it refrigerated in our warehouse before we ship it out so it stays fresher, cleaner and fresher source. It's the same stuff. We're just making sure because over six months out at room temperature, you kind of have more rancidity in it. So there could, there's some idea of rotten fish oil or rotten oils or oils that are at room temperature for too long. Even when you buy oil, it sits, you know, so, so, so we're trying to um, take those arguments and say, should I try to eat a little more animal products to get B12 and zinc or EPA and DHA? But to do that, you'd have to eat enough animal product to assure adequacy in those nutrients that may then give you a higher risk of toxicity. And that's why we're limiting that to a small amount and using supplements to make up the difference, which I think is just more, is more conservative, you know, more, um, is safer than as, because we know that the other things are more likely when you're exposed to more of these, we're seeing these toxins play a role in human health. Let, let me ask you this. You, you made the argument earlier about phytochemicals uh, mm -hmm. and ergothionine um, that, you know, we have this receptor that ergothionine has these benefits as far as protecting DNA from aging and that these flavonoids and other phytochemicals act on the NRF2 pathway, the xenohermetic pathway that have all yes. these translate into all these benefits. Correct. And that therefore, based on an evolutionary biology lens that humans have evolved to have those benefits because, you know, those, those things are good for us. Um, couldn't the same logic be used to, you know, using B12 and zinc and EPA and DHA, couldn't the same logic be applied to say, we, we have also evolved a need for animal foods? Yes. And I think that that's, I'm using that argument, actually. Okay. I'm saying that, um, that most of human evolution, um, there even, even gorillas in the early man ate some small amounts of animal products in their diet. And ate more of insect residue on their food. So they got more B12 exposure. And a vegan diet is not the natural diet for humans for over the millenniums. And the argument is we have to be take more care to make sure that what, what could be potentially missing. And are you getting adequate levels of these substances on if you're compl completely void of animal product in your diet? And we know that we are not. We know that there's a potential risk of B12 deficiency. Now, the vegan community doesn't really necessarily all agree with this idea of zinc supplementation by vegans, but we because because plant foods have adequate zinc, but it's true that the absorption of zinc is not as bioavailability. You don't absorb zinc as readily from plant foods as you do from animal products. It's much more conservative and safe based on the fact that that humans did probably eat small amounts of animal products. It's best to eat, to sup to look at what could be missing, and then when you're taking the zinc, the B12 the DHA EPA, because some people can convert enough and their omega-3 index could be adequate with just all plants. But genetically, we're a little different from each other. Some of us don't have the conversion enzyme ability to make, to take, just eat flax seeds and green vegetables and make enough long chain omega-3 fatty acids. And others of us do. Most people don't. Most people on vegan diets don't because I've measured hundreds and hundreds of people. Most of them don't have ideal levels. 
And they'll, you know, so, so much of the vegan community is going to argue with me and say that the vegan diet is a natural diet and you don't need to supplement anything and show me that these people are being hurt by not supplementing. And I'm saying, well, you know, um, I can show evidence of in my practice of clinical people who got in trouble long-term on a vegan diet because of low omega-3 index, but that's not the basis of coming to a conclusion. That just gives you a suspicion. But there's lots of studies that show that lower omega-3 index throughout life is 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 exposes you or puts you at higher risk of neurologic deficit in later life. Smaller brains, more cognitive impairment in later life, especially if you live much longer and not die in your, your 70s or 80s, you're living to be 90s, you're going to see more chance of dementia. And we don't want to live longer, so we really should try to maximize. So the question is, um, how many studies and how are they well done and how, how do they corroborate each other at showing that um, supplemental EPA and DHA is beneficial for people with low levels of omega-3 index and does it work to protect the brain as does eating fish does and i think we have the answer to those studies and, we, and my bet is that it's safer and more longevity producing to make sure that you have an adequate omega-3 index on a vegan diet as opposed to trying to eat more seafood and increase your other risks with potentially with potentially toxins or too much animal protein because you do get a benefit from having reduction to animal protein to very low levels because then we keep IGF-1 very low and certain other parameters that extend human lifespan. So yes, I'm advocating a conservatively supplemented vegan diet or one that's using animal products much more judiciously. And as you said, probably egg whites and you know, na and natural wild animals like salamanders and frogs and things that are living in the wild are probably safe, um, you know, wildy beast and antelopes. I'm joking now. Salamanders um, and frogs. I, I've never heard that one before. <laughs> Salamander. Well, what are the natural, what, what kind of animal products did humans really eat in their past? They ate worms and insects and frogs and salamanders and snakes and things they could easily catch. Maybe some rabbit and, you know, they uh, didn't go I mean, after. I mean, I mean, you could look to some modern day hunter gatherer tribes. I mean, as an example, and, and Stefan Lindeberg has cataloged a lot of those uh, those diets. He was a researcher that traveled the world and cattle, you know, very systematically cataloged the diets of a lot of uh, modern day hunter gatherer tribes and, and some that were sort of doing some agriculture, but still also doing some, some hunting and gathering. Um, you know, the most famous of those is the Hadza tribe. And, you know, there's videos online where they show the nutrient composition of the diet and a significant and is meat and from various ground Blood, yeah. and porcupines yeah. and and deer and things like that whatever they can can capture um i'm talking about i'm talking about the millennium of 150,000 years of humans on the planet and and the hundreds of thousands of years of pre-human um you know of the cro magnum and you know and, and of the of our earlier um human primates I'm not talking about one narrow part of, of history and one narrow tribe but those those tribes and those studies show that those populations do not have lengthy lifespans do not have excellent health into the later years. And they're not taking advantage of the, and they're not eating a diet, even though their diet may comparatively not be as bad as one that eats so much processed foods, fast foods and processed meats, animal products, fried foods. I mean, nothing is as bad. You, you can't make any diet worse than a standard American diet when you're eating fast foods, processed foods, fried foods, and things out of bags and boxes. And you, so anything people do is gonna be better than that. But let's compare you know, but obviously I'm saying, let's look at the blue zones where people live the longest. And a nutritarian diet is not a blue zone diet. It takes that to an, a, a whole other avenue of scientific integrity and, and trying to not just eat what's locally available, but eating, but eating what, show, what foods show the best effect against cancer. And right now in the modern world, we have about the leading cause of death is heart attacks and strokes in, ad, in, in adults. And the next leading cause of death is cancers. And by reducing heart attack, by wiping out heart attacks and cancers, and by slowing aging, and we can definitely prevent, um, have this ability to, to give humans the possibility of a much healthier and longer life. I find myself wanting to ask you so many more questions based on what you just said, but it would take us another hour. So we have we have to wrap up, unfortunately. I'll be back again then. <laughs> it would be a pleasure. Dr. Furman, this has been a joy. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, is there any final thought or two that you want to leave people with? I want to leave them with the thought that we're not just talking about these diet wars and questions. We're talking about people who already are overweight, have diabetes, have high blood pressure, have psoriasis, have asthma. And what I'm saying is that a nutritarian diet 
designed to maximize human lifespan, enables people to reverse disease and get rid of them and get healthy again. And my whole career over the last 30 years is, is treating and helping people that way. So they get rid of their diabetes, they get rid of their excess weight, they get rid of their high blood pressure, they get rid of their asthma, they get rid of their psoriasis, they get rid of their headaches. That therapeutically, it enables people to reverse disease and get well again. And that's the, the message I want to leave them with, that don't be satisfied with being sick and don't take drugs for the thinking that that's the avenue to you're going to get yourself well again. You have to eat. That healthy eating is incredibly protective and effective. Mm -hmm. Uh, agreed 100 percent i i have to say that you know i'm i'm someone personally who's a little bit more in the omnivorous direction than than you are but i really appreciate your work it's been a big influence on my own thinking and i i appreciate you and the way that you think through these issues and you're so focused on the evidence and you really think deeply about how to arrive at the best conclusions you think through all the different layers so thank you so much for all of your wisdom i really appreciate it dr Furman. and uh let people know where they can find you i know you've got a, a an upcoming retreat in our my hometown san diego uh, but let people know about that um yes it's drfurman.com d-r-f-u-h-r-m-a-n.com my most recent book is eat for life and my retreat in san diego was open 365 days a year People come here to get healthy and to stay here for a month, two or three, and to get their get their health back, learn how to make healthy food taste great, and go home with the tools to be able to apply it and stick to it at home. So it's not a it's it's an ongoing um, the Eat Live Retreat is an ongoing business that that I live right next door to it, and I have a staff there that helps people all year round. Wonderful, thank you so much, Dr. Furman. I look forward to our next conversation. Take care. Bye. Hey there, this is Ari again. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, if you found it valuable, please share it with your friends, share it with your family, help me get the word out there. Also, if you're on YouTube, make sure to hit the subscribe button and hit that little bell to get notifications every time we release a new video or new episode of the podcast. And if you're listening to this, make sure to subscribe to this podcast on iTunes or on your favorite podcast. Thanks so much for supporting my work at the Energy Blueprint. I hope you enjoyed this episode. I will see you in the next.